Today on Lockdown Red Wings, Axel Sandin Pelika signs his entry-level contract. And what will Raymond and Sider's next contracts look like? Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a former producer for 97, won the ticket while Scotty is the host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Game off. We got to talk more about Monopoly Go uh, just because, I mean, if you love Monopoly, which is just the, the classic board game, when you think of board games, you honestly, I don't think of any other board game besides Monopoly. After that, maybe it's like shoots and ladders and stuff, but it's Monopoly right at the top of that ladder. And now you can play Monopoly on the go with, well, Monopoly Go. It's the fast-paced game let, that lets you team up with friends for tournaments to unlock awesome prizes like unique stickers, for trading, cool game, cool playing pieces, and hilarious emojis for taunting your friends. So download Monopoly Go now free on the Google Play or the App Store. Game on. Scotty, what's more painful right now, uh, covering the Red Wings during the offseason or covering the Tigers when the starting pitching shoves but then gets no run support? Um, I would say the Tigers pretty comfortably at the present moment. All right. I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that. That's the good answer, by the way, because you, you want to say on the Red Wings podcast that you prefer this. That's just smart I'll business. say it on the Tigers podcast, too. <laughs> yeah. I think people will agree with me. <laughs> so the Red Wings today, uh, today being Monday, February 6th, as we record this, announced the signing of Axel Sandin Pelica to a three-year entry-level contract, which is fantastic because that means he is officially brought into the fold of the organization. He is, uh, it's going to be an AAV of almost one and a half million, which I guess that's the going rate for first round picks. They probably have high expectations for this kid, but uh, he finished this last season with, I'm going to, I'm going to try my best and I'm very sorry for any Swedes who may listen to this podcast. Uh, but, Skel Skel Eftia AIK of the SHL, 39 games played, 18 points, 10 goals, 8 assists. They won the championship, and he is confirmed to be returning to the SHL next season as well. Eisman alluded to that in the end of season availability, but I think Sounding Pelica outright outright said it himself uh, around the time of this extension on social media, so or this contract on social media. I mean, Scott, there's not a lot to break down here other than general excitement for Axel Sandin Pelica's future in the Red Wings organization. Yeah, absolutely, man. I that, those this time of year is uh, those are fun notifications to get, obviously, right? And we'd rather be playing games, but uh, this is a a yeah, it's fun, and we've already had a couple of these this off season already, and. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people are really excited about him. It, it sounds like he is uh, not necessarily going to come over to North America right away. Uh, by the sounds of it, he'll probably stay over there for at least the start of next year. But we'll see how the summer goes. And uh, yeah, it's 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 exciting. I mean, people are really pumped about him. We were really pumped about him. Not only uh, you know talking about him now, but on draft night, and, and he's somebody that obviously everybody has. A close eye on so yeah i mean this is this is uh, another step in the defenseman pipeline that the wings have kind of been uh trying to build since eiserman took over yeah also notably he was a half point per game in the shl playoffs again they they ended up winning the championship and i think most notably about that production is you see 18 and 39 you're like oh half point per game he's supposed to be an offensive uh, defenseman he's only 19 years old he's 19 playing in a men's league yeah. producing at half point per game he's gonna take a step forward next year and i don't think i don't have to defend axel signing bellica because i know that he is probably the prospect right now that red wings fans are the most hyped about because when you you hear the you hear the words puck moving defenseman offensive defenseman I think a lot of people's brains go to like your Kale McCars, your Quinn Hughes, not trying to comp, not trying to comp ASP to oh, that yet, <laughs> but everybody wants their own version of that player. And I think a lot of Red Wings fans hope that ASP can be, you know, 
Shane Goss to spare, but with better defense, you know, 60 sure. points a season would be fantastic. That'd be a huge win for where they got him in the draft, but just having a, a top four paired defenseman who can score points is consistently is going to be a big get for the Red Wings. And most notably he plays the right side, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah, I think the right side thing is probably the biggest <laughs> uh, conversation point of all of this. Yeah. Um, you're doing a lot of, you're not, comparing him to a lot of people for someone who's compared him to quite a few people already. <laughs> it's really, well, I, really slick how you, uh, how you do that. Well, so I, I had to stop myself short because even though I was saying it's so hard to meet that expectations, it'd be so unfair to say those words. So I stopped short of it. I backtracked a little bit, but if we could get somebody who could be 50, 60 points consistently, in the NHL, yeah. that'd be great. He's dropping Makar he, is fine, but anybody else is too <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, Quinn Hughes too much, too much to go that far. Uh, no, I, I obviously just um obviously giving you a hard time, but like, yeah, it's it's. I mean, uh, first off, I think next season, hopefully, like obviously, he's going to have a little bit of a closer eye on him now. But I do think that, um, you know, when he comes over to North America, that is going to be a guy who has the potential to to move up very quickly. And there's obviously going to be the adjustment period on the new ice when he does. And again, it doesn't sound like he's going to uh, right away or, you know, to start off next season. The, the, the rumor mill is that he probably stays over there for a little bit longer, but um, it, it, it is going to be, I think he is a candidate just because of the way he plays um, where, you know, like when, when he comes over here, once he gets acclimated to North American ice, it, it could be a, a really fast trajectory. And if I want to be conservative about my, my, my projections, my predictions with ASP, it's probably two years, the first two years of his ELC he spends, uh, which can, can slide by the way, but, uh, 25, 2025 and 2026, let's put it that way, rather than the first two years of the ELC, but 25 and 26, I expect not to see him in the Red Wings uniform. He's only 19 years old. Not everyone's Lucas Raymond or Dylan Larkin. and can make the team right out of the get-go. He is going to be coming to North America for training camp, by the way, though, which is really, really fun to see. Um, yeah. And so we will get a look at uh, of him in North America, which is going to be great. But I don't think with the fact that he's going to play another year at SHL for development, and then he has to transition that offensive game to a smaller ice surface, I think it's going to be a couple years. He might get a look. Later in the season in 25, 26, if, you know, things go according to plan, nothing can never be predicted, but as exciting as this is, it's going to be a couple of years yet before we see him. And he's a, oh, I don't want to yeah. rush anyone. As someone like him, I want to have all the time he needs to adjust to North American ice because uh, trying to rush a player of that style to the NHL, I don't think is going to translate very well there. He's going to need time. I think to, to get used to that. Yeah, hundred percent. I wasn't trying to imply that this dude's going to be like in the NHL next year. I, he's no. Again, he's he's not even going to be in uh, on North American ice next season, most likely. Uh, nonetheless, you know, getting moved up. Yeah. So yeah, I, I wasn't trying to to imply quick riser meant he was going to you know like be in a winged wheel by the end of next season or anything. But uh, but I do think you know you start looking two three seasons down the road. He becomes a and already is one of the more enticing prospects in the organization. Absolutely. Uh, so that about does it with that conversation. Just ex overall general excitement that ASP is officially in the organization. He signed that ELC. And uh, as the next weeks go on, hopefully we'll see bigger signings by the Detroit Red Wings uh, by the name of Moritz Sider and Lucas Raymond, because those are the big fish that. Red Wings fans are keeping their eye on and also who we will be talking about in segments two and three of Lockdown Red Wings. So stay tuned. All right. Game off. We've talked about it. The title sponsor. We're going to talk about it again here. Monopoly Go again. One of it's the classic twist on it is a twist on the classic game, the classic board game that you played with your friends and family growing up to frustrate your friends and family by taxing the ever-living heck out of them. And now you can do the same on the go with the mobile app. Uh, so 
In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends four time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get unique stickers. You can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes, cool new playing pieces to travel with the boards with, hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. That's the most exciting part, is just messing with your friends' heads. It's that's the best part of Monopoly. Plus, Monopoly Go. Feels new and exciting with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a robot pachinko machine. And there's tons. There's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download Mon Monopoly Go on the Google Play or App Store. Game on. Segment two, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Scotty, Cider, and Raymond are RFAs officially. The season is over, so they need new contracts. And this is going to be the big question all offseason is how much and for how long. Which of these two players would you like to start talking about first? I Wow, what a question. I think we should start with Mo. You want to talk about more at Cider? I think Cider is actually, in my opinion, if I were general manager, and thank goodness I'm not, uh, but if I were general manager, he's again. the easier of the two to for me to project a signing for just because of his age, the position he plays, and the fact that there is around the league a lot of examples of young D-men being signed to contracts all around the same value. So I think Moritz Cider is pretty easy to uh to project out, which of course means I'm going to be wrong on every single front. But uh, of course, what do you first? Let's talk about years, Scotty. Where do you think he signs in terms of term? Well, I, honestly, I, I think that is uh, that is the conversation more than the AAV. Even I think we're all pretty well aware that he's going to get uh, pretty hefty chunk of the cap hit when it's all said and done but uh RFAs are super super interesting and there it's a case by case basis with you know every RFA obviously and this is somebody that the wings want to build around and want to be here for a long time and is obviously a part of the core of this team um but if they can't necessarily agree on AAV if they're still a little bit apart on that then you could just see the okay well give me the the you know one or two year deal to take me to the end of RFA status kind of thing but I do think that the wings want to just get the long-term deal done right now and I have no reason to uh, think that Mo wouldn't want that either so I I mean if we're expecting and anticipating the big deal, then I think max amount of years is probably what you're looking at. Yeah. And I mean, Iserman has pretty much gone on the record and said multiple times that he does not like giving out yeah. max length deals like that's uh, if it hasn't been said explicitly, it's kind of an open secret. One of those worst kept secrets in the organization and it makes sense, right? We've talked about the rolling cap structure that is seems to be implemented with every single year guys coming off the books to give you cap space to continue to improve the team. And by signing a guy like Moritz Sutter to eight years, now you're locked into that paycheck. But it's also a really common sentiment among the across the league. And not saying that, you know, if your friend jumps off the bridge, do you do it too? But a lot of general managers are signing their young rising stars to long-term deals now because that way in years five, six, seven, and eight, as the cap rises, that deal looks like an absolute steal, which would be what you would assume your cup window is. And while Cider hasn't gotten back to that 50 point marker, he had his rookie season. He took on more workload this year, more difficult workload this season by far than any other defenseman in the NHL. And he handled it amicably like he looked good out there for them obviously there were games he got exposed but the deployment again was just ridiculous and we were staunch cider defenders i thought he had a great season again uh and you know met expectations or exceeded them just because of we weren't expecting him to be deployed this way 
And if we ever upgrade our defense enough to take some of that added difficulty away from him, he's really going to flourish offensively. And we know he has that in him as well. And I know this organization believes in Cider as well. I think Cider is, if you're going to sign Larkin to an eight year max deal, I think Cider is like the same mentality on the back end. Like you're going to sign the guy you know is your number one defenseman for the what you hope to be the entirety of his career to a max length deal and keep him locked in at a reasonable number for the final four years of that contract when you're trying to win now and add pieces to your team then instead of having to revisit this discussion four years from now and have to give him another pay raise above whatever mark you give him now. I think it just makes a lot of sense for Cider as a true number one defenseman because that's what he is, and he still has yet to hit his ceiling because, again, he's only 22 years old. I think it just makes sense to give him that max length deal. Now, when talking about contract uh, salary-wise, I think there's a lot of other players that have signed deals in recent years that you can look to as examples. Owen Power being one of those. He already has signed uh, in, what a seven-year, 8.35-per-year million-dollar contract. You had Miro Heiskinen in 2021 sign a eight-year deal worth $8.45 million. Quinn Hughes in 2021. Uh, that one I don't look at as a good comparison because Quinn Hughes is just purely offensive defenseman style. Like he's going to rack up points. So a slightly different role that he plays. But back in 2021, he signed for six years, 7.85 because it was a couple of years shorter. It was a lower number on the pay. Uh, and then guys, of course, you had uh, Jake Sanderson as well of the Ottawa Senators who was taken the year after who also signed a, I think it was like an eight-year deal worth $8 million. And I think that's probably where Cider's going to come in is eight by eight. Yeah, eight eight years, $8.05 million for Jake Sanderson, who, by the way, production-wise, not that production is all that matters for a defenseman, right? We care about how they play defense, and Cider is a great two-way defenseman. He can produce points at 40-plus points again for the third year in a row and also has taken the toughest minutes like we were saying. I think that eight by eight is like the slam dunk contract wise for more at cider, because there's just a lot of examples around the league of that being the standard. But at the same time, I don't think he has the point production to kind of push him into that eight, five, nine million dollar category quite yet. Um, I disagree slightly. I, I okay. would be, sh- I, I would just be shocked if it was eight by eight. I fully expect him to get more. I fully expect it to be in the eight and a half. Um, it wouldn't even shock me if it pushed nine. Um, and and part of that is just simply the cap keeps going up. And when Which those contracts were signed, right, that's how much of a cap hit it was. And when he signs his contract this offseason, the cap is, uh, you know, the assumption is that the, the cap's going to be slightly more. So percentage-wise, maybe it's a similar cap hit. Um, but I, I expect the, the AAV to be more. And I also think that there's something to be said uh, again, just for, um, I don't know, future presumed role. Not that any of those guys aren't going to be, you know, top pair defensemen. Obviously, uh, they are for their own teams. But I, I do think that uh, the just uh, with what we saw on the ice, with the weight that was put on his shoulders, again, we talked, we've buried the, and, and really, you know, kicked the heck out of the deployment conversation and whatnot. But um this guy, has he missed an NHL game yet? He has not. He has right. played every like, single NHL game since he started this his is, career. Not only is he the presumed number one and has been your number one since joining the team, but on top of that, uh, he has quite literally played every single game. Uh, and, and I think that all of those things combined, and not that you know he's going to go his whole career without missing a game or anything, that'd be ridiculous, but I, I, I do think that that is uh that is is something to point at i also think that just style right like you're talking about the different style between certain players i'm not sure how much point production is really going to be uh i don't, I don't know driven home in these or, or how much of a factor those are that is going to be necessarily for his conversation not that it's irrelevant uh, but I, I think that there's a very hefty and strong argument from Moritz Sider's camp and his agent and whatnot of, hey, like, you know, yes, the point totals might be less than some of the guys you just brought up, but 
that doesn't mean that he is not worth eight and a half to even eight, seven, five mil. Well, in addition to what you just said about what they would argue with the point totals, it would be he didn't have the point totals they did, but those defensemen were never asked to play in the situations that our client has been, which is penalty kill, almost entirely defensive zone deployments. All defensive like, zone deployments. Again, you can you look at go to Dabber Frozen Tools, go to the player usage chart and compare. You can look, you can pick teams and pick players. Compare Cider to Kale McCarr, Quinn Hughes, Owen Power, Rasmus Dahlin. And all of those players I just listed besides Cider have over 50% offensive zone deployment, where Cider is staunchly defensive zone deployment against the toughest competition. Like that is a huge sticking point that they're going to use in negotiation. And I think you brought up a good point. You know, I think that you are actually correct in uh, your assessment that he could be getting paid over $8 million because you're right, the cap does raise every year. And a lot of those contracts I brought up were signed in 2021, 2022. It's a couple of years later. I don't believe, however, he will get paid more annually than Dylan Larkin. And I think that's because that Dylan Larkin contract really sets the internal cap structure. I feel like that's the bar that at this point, Steve Eiserman has set that 8.7 million. He's not going to give anyone more than that unless they are above that caliber of player. I think Cider will be that uh, that caliber, if not better, of player. Obviously, he's not comparing a center to a defenseman in terms of how they play, but just in like what tier they are in, I think Cider can be that level if he's not already, and then rise above that even with uh, above Larkin. Uh, but that's why I think now you lock him in at that eight years eight year deal before you have to play, pay him ten million dollars. I agree. And and that is the the one question I have for you is if it Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what, you, what would you what were you gonna ask? If it eclipses nine mil, do you have like I don't think anyone's gonna be mad at Cider getting locked up long term, no matter really what the term is, but if it eclipses nine mil, are you I don't know, any more hesitant than anything than if it is, like you said, under Dylan Larkin's contract. I would st I would be a little like, wow, they really have faith in this guy to be the guy. Uh, it would actually almost a little reaffirm me that they have as that's what they think they have yeah. in this kid because that's what we think we have in him. Um, and I still think by the if it was an eight year deal, by the end of that eight year deal, it would be a, a pretty good looking number. Uh, but I would be definitely a little taken aback that they gave it to him now. And by the way, he's 23, not 22. I forgot that he recently turned 23. Yes. Uh, just to save myself from the myriad of comments <laughs> saying that he's 23. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I would I would be surprised, but I'd be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> he's worth it. Uh, all right. Okay. So let's head to segment three, Scotty. We'll talk about Lucas Raymond. So stay tuned to Locked on Red Wings. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Scotty, did you see the Maple Leafs losing overtime in game seven? Oh, did I? Oh, you hate to see it. That that set pasta play. Oh, beautiful. Now, if Boston could get eliminated by Florida, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> and then but, Florida could get eliminated, eliminated by. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, just but, lesser of two evils until we get to the cup, really. Right. <laughs> Uh, right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty Lucas Raymond now. And this guy is this guy's a tougher conversation for me because and I'll admit it, I feel like going into the season, I had different expectations and was looking at different comparables because I didn't expect this level of a breakout season by him. And oh, I, yeah. I really only have one comparable of a contract for Lucas Raymond this year. But here's my question before I get to that. Do we think Lucas Raymond signs a max length eight year deal with the understanding that Steve Eiserman tends to stray, tends to stay away, steer away? That's the phrase, steer away from those long term deals. You know, I, 
I think if you show that you are comfortable giving cider one, then uh, then that is enough evidence for me that they would probably like to give Raymond one as well. Um, that being said, I think Raymond is really the now naturally the opposite will happen, but like I, I think Raymond is kind of the all or nothing uh, in terms of length with this conversation. I think that Raymond could get the eight or he could get, you know, a couple of years just to bridge him past RFA status. And neither of those would really surprise me. Um, but I do think that, again, if if you're confident doing that with Cider, then I don't have any reason to believe they wouldn't feel, obviously, for I don't think as much money. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe they wouldn't feel comfortable doing that with Razor either. Yeah, this one's weird for me because I'm so confident, confident and comfortable giving it to Cider. And after the season, Raymond has like, sure, ha why not? The main reason I think it could differ is because Raymond plays wing. And in For terms sure. of valuable hockey positions, not to say it's not valuable because it's still incredibly valuable having a scoring well, winger, right? a lot of them. Here. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's the winger's role. Center has the most responsibility on the ice outside, obviously, goaltender, whose job is to stop the goal, stop the puck. Mm, uh, center you. has to play defense has to play offense and everyone has to play defense, but you know what I mean? Like they're responsible for driving the puck and driving. What plays. did goalie do again? I missed that. They stopped the puck. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, and de defensemen like number one, D men are hard to come by when you have them, you hold yeah. on to them scoring wingers. And I'm not trying to undersell at, at all. What Lucas Raymond did this year. We've talked a lot about how much he's been no, a game it changer, devalues contracts, but it devalues contracts. That's a great way of putting it. And I'm not trying to say it's going to devalue him to 4 million or anything. Cause I highly no, doubt that, but it does make me wonder if he comes in at slightly less term and slightly less AAV because he's a winger and Eisenman says, okay, now replicate that again, do that for me again. Prove to me that you can get 70 plus points and 30 goals. And that this wasn't just a one-off season. I, this is why, and like I could, but at the same time, I can completely see it the other way. So this is why I'm so unsure on what they would do well, with Lucas Raymond. And the only reason I would say five, six-year deal with Lucas Raymond is just because Eisenman likes to steer away. Actually, I need to check on how many more years he has RFA status before I make that statement. Um, but I would let, let me put it this way: if it's not, you said all or nothing. For me, it's. It's either eight years or all the way up until the end of RFA status where you have to pay him again. Right. And yeah. then you pay That's... him per year the length of the contract, which is a pretty standard practice. So if it's yeah. six years, you pay him $6 million. You give him a big, a big raise. If it's five years, you give him $5 million. And then you revisit it uh, come the offseason or six and a half or five and a half uh, because that brings you to the comparison, right? Matthew Boldy, he's he was signed by the Minnesota Wild seven years, $7 million. Uh, he was signed to that contract on January 16th of 2023, which means that was after a 63-point season in 81 games where he had 31 goals. Very similar to what Mortz or uh, Lucas Raymond just did. So I think those are like that's the comparable contract. Yeah, I would agree, and that's what I was implying too. I don't know if I said that, but I, I meant to. If I didn't, that when I say all or nothing, I I. Also think that if he's not going to get the full eight, then he's probably going to get something that just takes him to, you know, when he's a UFA. Um, yeah, I I would agree with you. I think that, that that's a, a really good comp. I would expect something if it is the full eight. Well, I guess AAV is a little different. You don't even necessarily need to say, you know, it needs to be this by eight because uh, whatever, even if it's just a couple year deal, I guess the AAV is is somewhat relative and all the same, but I, I do think that that's a pretty good comp. I would expect him to get over seven uh, based on what he did. And I think that that is where, again, the conversation comes. Are you more comfortable giving him, let's say it's seven and a half or, or seven to five over, I don't know. I, I think he could push eight as well. Like, again, I, I, I don't think that that's, ridiculous uh to have that come you know seven seven five eight million i don't think that's really out of the realm of possibility 
And I think that leads to the conversation again of does that change? If that's going to be the price tag, does that change the uh, conversation in regards to how many years you want to lock him up for? I don't think it really does just because of how young he is. Uh, but I know that for some people, I'm sure it would. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, 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 there are other comparables you can look at, but they're older players. Like, for instance, Alex DeBrinkett. He's 26 sure. when he signed his, what was it, four-year extension for $7.85 million a year. Raymond, obviously, better production than Cider or DeBrinkett this year. I keep wanting to say Cider for some reason. Than DeBrinkett this year. But DeBrinkett was also five years older. You know, four years older. Yeah, five years older at the start of the season. So there was a higher price tag to be paid for that player. And there was a bunch of other, there's a lot of other examples of that too, where the players I wanted to comp him to were all 26 at the time of their signing their extension, which is the future Red Wings would probably be looking at if they decide to give a up until the end of like the final year of your restricted free agency. So they don't hit UFA. You can give them that one last deal to then take him to like 32, 33 years old. Sure. Um, I don't know. It's it's going to be really interesting. I think Cider's no, like a slam dunk. I think that's a decent roadmap. That one you just laid out there at the end. You you give him something to give him to you know a year, um, to to UFA status, and then that's when you extend him. But at the same time, that's that's going to cost you more money because then he's a UFA and the cap's going to go up from now until then, et cetera. And you know he might get better. <laughs> like I, I just think I just think that like that, there, there's a lot of factors as to you know you you can play that game and and quote unquote risk it a little bit. Um, but if he stays healthy and performs, then you're going to owe him even more when he's a UFA because that's you know how it works so i uh yeah man it's it's there's again that, that's why i kind of expect it to be one or the other i i kind of expect it to be either you know what we're just going all out gonna give both of these guys eight um i would be kind of surprised if cider didn't get eight regardless uh but with with raymond i think it's a little bit trickier because of all the reasons we've already talked about yeah absolutely uh well let's move on now to real quick just ro world championship roster updates uh, is that's going to get underway here? I think on May 10th is when it begins. That's in yeah. uh, Czechia. And Team USA has a lot of Red Wings on him. No Larkin. He initially did join to play with Team USA, but unfortunately he got injured or the in whatever injury he may have had did not heal. So he is out. Uh, so just take it easy, Captain. <laughs> how about, up, uh, how about that goaltending situation, though? Yeah, let's get to that. I mean, so Alex Lyon was already announced, but then they announced Trey Augustine. Michigan State's Trey Augustine would be the other goalie. So a fantastic opportunity for Trey Augustine to get some reps in with Alex Lyon, the, the goalie, the current goalie for the team he wants to play for one day. So Alex Lyon, obviously being a journeyman, has probably a lot of experience and good advice to give to Trey Augustine. But then you also have Jeff Petrie on the team and – both Alex Westland, the goalie coach, and Derek Lalone are on the coaching staff as well. So Team USA stacked full of Red Wings and Red Wings organizational pieces. But you also have Lucas Raymond going to Team Sweden. And Oli Mata is going to be captaining, I believe I saw, his hockey team, which is fantastic. What's that? Finland. Team Finland he's captaining. Which is crazy. That, shout uh, out Oli Mata, baby. Shout out Oli Mata. Moritz Sider, on the other hand will not be attending world championships because he could not get his insurance situation squared up, which honestly I'm okay with. Like even if, if Raymond didn't play, I'd be okay with that. They're about to get their contracts. I want them to stay healthy. Let them just work out and stay healthy. It's also really fun to watch them play though. <laughs> it is. No, you're not wrong. so fun, dude. Well, all those international tournaments are, although it always yeah. confuses me when we have one during the all-star break. And then we also have one, or I'm sorry, at New Year's we have one, and then we also have one as soon as the season ends. But I understand, you know, one's U20, one's U18, although we have a U18 tournament. One's World Juniors, and the other one's the World Tournament. But it's all like, we had a U18 World Tournament just now, before this one. What isn't Juniors, basically? I guess you have 20, some 20-something-year-olds 20 in that one, too. It, it gets confusing. I get overwhelmed by all the international play, man. But that's my own problem. That's, that's my problem. Word. <laughs> it was a good any, monologue there. I you like got any? Uh, you got any final thoughts? 
I don't think so, man. We ball. We ball. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day. Every day.